um, really do just about anything with. Um, and somehow, in some way, relates in a little bit to the topic of tonight's uh, Wednesday Night Live, which is basically how to mimic the effects of calorie restriction. And it looks like we are now live on YouTube and we have some more people filtering in. We have Pat is here, uh, Luis, uh, Leah, Felicia, Clarence, Marcy, Faye, um, Eleanor, Shoshana, Louis. Welcome everybody to tonight's class. Glad we have such a great attendance. And we should get started in just a minute. Now, uh, probably week five, I would say, I did a class that was basically about how to grow food at home. And for a couple of weeks, I'd actually given you a few updates on some of the experiments that I was doing at home. And someone had asked me this week if I could show what I've been working on. So I wanted to show you that uh, what one of the things we spoke about is something called Kratky hydroponics, that's C-R-A-T-K-Y. And basically this, you can regrow vegetables from, from the store. And that's one of the easiest ways to get started. But I just wanted to show you, this is, it might be hard to show, but um, this is a regrown head of lettuce, romaine lettuce, that is just four weeks of growth, basically regrew the entire thing. It's growing inside of a mason jar um, and requires absolutely no movement or, you know, you don't have to do anything with this. It's pretty, pretty remarkable. So someone asked me to show that. So I figured I would. So tonight uh, we're going to be speaking about calorie restriction, not doing calorie restriction, but what the effects are and how to get those same benefits through other mechanisms. And we'll be talking about five in particular. And this was basically inspired by an article in uh, one of the journals from the, the magazine, from the Life Extension Foundation, they did a very brief overview. We're gonna go a little bit deeper and talk about what are some lifestyle changes that you can make? What are some supplements and foods that you can, that you can incorporate into your lifestyle to get the same benefits? Now, the benefits of, of calorie restriction are that basically it activates all these mechanisms in your body that should improve your longevity in addition to improve your health. And we'll go through all that as well. So let me share my screen so we can get started one moment. And let me find, here we go. And you should see my screen. If you don't, let me know. And as always, this is, if you have any questions, just let me know. There's a chat box that all of you can use. And let me blow this up a little bit so you can see it better. Okay, now don't get scared about what you see here. There are a lot of words here that probably many of you have never heard of and some uh, people who are into sort of life extension or optimal health and really who get nitty gritty into the details will have recognized some of these things. Also, if you have been on any of my talks regarding what's called biological fasting or a way of getting the benefits of fasting uh, without fasting, essentially, using a, a lower calorie diet, some of the terms are going to be familiar to you. Nonetheless, by the end of tonight's uh, Wednesday Night Live, you'll be able to understand everything that you see here. So CR is an abbreviation for calorie restriction. And there are actually a whole host of people who actually do calorie restriction, which basically uh, is a, essentially reducing your calories, but without any kind of malnutrition. In other words, they're eating very high nutrient density. So although they're not getting the overall number of calories, they're, they're reducing the number of calories, they're still getting an adequate amount of, of micronutrients and macronutrients. And essentially um, a 30 to 60% reduction in calories could extend the human life by 10 to 20%. And that's sort of what your, what essentially the experts tend to think. 
It's an amazing article by, um, by this um, person, last name Arbor, on this particular website that really is pretty remarkable. Um, and some of the things that we're going to be talking about tonight actually were, a, I learned additional information from this particular article. Now, believe it or not, by the end of this talk, you're going to understand this crazy diagram, which I'm not actually gonna freak you out with until, until the very end when you'll be like, wow, okay, that, that actually makes sense. Believe it or not, that's, that's our goal for tonight. So the first thing that we're going to be talking about, and I might add this, uh, there's an organization called the CR Way, and they have all kinds of education and tutorials, all kinds of things to help people who wanna go on calorie restriction. But if you don't have to go on calorie restriction and you can still get the same benefits, that's what we're essentially going to be talking about tonight. So the first one is, we're going to talk about decreasing mTOR. Now remember, don't, don't worry about these terms because we're going to explain what they are very, very shortly. So mTOR uh, has been described as the live fast, die young pathway, which basically means that it's a nutrient sensing pathway. It is uh, essentially sensing certain types of nutrients that are going to elevate things in our body that make our bodies grow. So when mTOR is high, as an example, things like muscle growth are going to be upregulated. So when, you, when bodybuilders are taking things like branch chain amino acids, one of the reasons they're doing that is because there is a, an, a amino acid, one of the amino, a branch chain amino acids that's called leucine. And leucine actually is responsible for increasing mTOR and creating an anabolic effect, which basically means you're able to build muscle. So a lot of times I'll have people who are trying to get into shape and they are getting trained by someone who is in the bodybuilding industry. And they're often suggested to increase animal protein and increase, sometimes take branch chain amino acids as a supplement. And if you want to increase your muscle mass, then that's actually a good way of doing it. But because this is a nutrient sensing pathway that speeds things up, that causes things to grow, it can also cause other things to grow like cancer, like tumors, that sort of thing. So the key here is that we don't necessarily want to completely eliminate mTOR because if you have say not a lot of muscle, you do want to increase your muscle mass a little bit because that's associated with, with a whole host of other beneficial things. The key that we're trying to come up with here is to have an average mTOR, an average level that is reasonably low because high, high level is, as, as we said, described as a live fast die young pathway. Now the things that elevate mTOR, we've already spoken about those branch chain amino acids. And that's another reason why, as an example, when you study plant protein versus animal protein, you're not gonna get the same anabolic muscle growing effect that you would normally get if you were just having animal protein. But for longevity's sake, we wanna have an average mTOR that is actually very low. Uh, this stands for a mammalian target of rapamycin. And rapamycin is actually a chemotherapy agent that scientists who take this cancer drug because they want to decrease mTOR. So while I don't necessarily recommend that, I think it's unwise. There are many people in the anti-aging industry who are actually looking and taking rapamycin. Things that elevate mTOR, essentially insulin. So what raises insulin? Well, sugar and simple carbohydrates, as well as animal protein. We've spoken about this on several other Wednesday Night Live episodes where we've spoken about how the general conception of insulin is that it's somehow just related to sugar, but the more animal protein that you eat, the higher your level of insulin and the higher your mTOR is going to be, which is going to be associated with a decreased longevity, decreased lifespan. And there is a reason why, generally speaking, hardcore bodybuilders do not live very, very long lives. 
And bodybuilders like Arnold Schwarzenegger, as an example, he has very famously reduced his animal protein consumption dramatically as, as he's gotten older, probably because he's a smart guy and he's probably seen some of, of the things that we're talking about tonight. So in addition to, to uh, taking rapamycin, we want to make sure that our animal protein is low and our sugar and simple carbohydrates are low. Simple carbohydrates like, uh, sorry, I'm just moving over here. Uh, Malka is asking, uh, does animal protein include chicken? It does, it includes chicken, it even includes fish. Uh, basically, if it's a living animal, uh, these animal proteins are basically going to have branch chain amino acids that are going to elevate, uh, specifically leucine, that are going to elevate mTOR. So the question often comes to me when I talk about this, because this has come up many times, questions often raise, well, then how do I determine what the best amount the, of animal protein is. And that's obviously a complicated question and in the sense that I would need to know everything else that's happening in your diet. But my general rule is uh, no more, ideally, no more than 20 grams of animal protein per day. Now that's not your total protein per day because you're going to be eating, I'm assuming you're going to be eating a load of green leafy vegetables and a whole host of other plant matter that's going to, to get you to a point where your animal protein is to at a certain high level. Uh, but in terms of animal protein, if, you know, 20 grams, now 20 grams is essentially a can of sardines or, you know, a, a palm piece of chicken or four around, I guess, let's see, four eggs, thereabouts, um, and that's gonna be around 20 grams. And if you do that, then try not to do more than that. Doesn't mean you don't have to. Now, there is a caveat here. And the caveat is something that was pointed out by an author by the name of Walter Longo, who wrote a really fabulous book called The Longevity Diet. And in that diet, in that book, he describes what, what biological fasting is, which is that reduced calorie diet for five, for five days that we have a program on Miracle Noodle for. But in that book, he basically describes how at a certain age, you know, when you get into your 70s, this mTOR is probably not as much of a factor, which means that your animal protein consumption can be higher and it's likely not going to have any adverse effects on your longevity. So if you're in your 70s and you wanna have more animal protein than that, assuming everything else is fine, assuming your body fat percentage is good, um, assuming that, you know, you're eating an overall healthy diet with lots of various plants along with all that other stuff, then it's, then it's generally, um, going to be okay. So I hope Malka that answers your question. Um, and maybe I went too, too deep <laughs> into that. Uh, the other things that, that are going to decrease mTOR is resveratrol and resveratrol is going to pop up many, many places here. And the reason is sort of one of those things that's you know found in, in red wine and the seed of grapes, the, sk the skin of red, red grapes. And it's been around for a very long time. It's one of the first sort of anti-aging, antioxidant vitamins, supplements that came out so many years ago. And you'll see why, because it, it repeats in, in various other categories that we'll be talking about tonight. Uh, turmeric or curcumin also tends to decrease mTOR. But the, the greatest thing you can do is lifestyle, which is basically reducing simple carbohydrates, reducing um, animal protein, and, um, and paying attention to that so that you decrease, uh, decrease mTOR. Okay, let's move on. And thank you, Malka, for the question. And again, if anyone has any questions, just put them into the uh, chat box. Okay, next is AMPK. And this is basically known as the master switch of the body. It's the central regulator of energy. It basically activates the, the, the metabolic processes in your cell. And one of the reasons that metformin works, and metformin is because it activates AMPK. It's 
it's going to be a regulator of the energy and it's going to affect your blood sugar. And metformin, if, if you're not aware of, it's a very popular type, type two diabetes medication, it also has other uses as well. And it's also being studied because of the fact that it activates AMPK in a formal study to determine whether it actually lengthens life. It's also been shown, or at least uh, observed, I should say, that people who are on metformin actually have a decreased risk for certain cancers as well. And that all relates to the fact that it's activating AMPK. There are probably other things that metformin does that we're actually not perfectly 100% aware of at this time. And they're, they're still sort of working on, on that as well. A resveratrol, again, you need to really take you know, to get the amount of resveratrol that you would need, it's very difficult to get from dietary sources. Uh, unfortunately, you'd have to drink like, you know, <laughs> 10 bottles of wine or, or something like something crazy like that. Uh, so while it's not as popular of a, oh, you know, day in, day out supplement as it was, you know, 15 years ago when all the initial studies came out, for people who are really into life extension, uh, they are generally speaking, uh, the ones that I've met actually do take do take resveratrol. Quercetin, which is has very high levels in onions, but also in apples, honeys, raspberries, grapes. This is also going to activate AMPK. Um, it's also very, very good for, for your immune system and several authorities on supplementation and viral diseases have actually recommended quercetin during, uh, if, you, if you are dealing with, with COVID actually, uh, green tea, berberine, which has also been a very popular supplement for people with type two diabetes. And for those who are interested in, in life extension, it it's, has high levels in this European barberry and the herb which uh, called golden seal. Um, hesperidin also, uh, there, there is a supplement uh, that is called AMPK Activator that Life Extension Foundation a company sells. I believe it has um, hesperidin in it. Um, next is gynostema. I'm actually drinking um, gynostema tea here. It's, some, it's a tea that I drink every day. I, I enjoy the flavor of it. The one um, that I use is, is called Spring Dragon Longevity Tea by um, Dragon Herbs. And uh, people take it in a supplement. I think that AMPK activator that uh, Life Extension Foundation sells has gynostema tea in it, but the gynostema tea that I drink, which you can buy on various ones, this, this has um, some other things in it as well. Um, and it tastes very, very good. And cold exposure. Cold exposure can also activate AMPK. It's another reason why it actually has some blood sugar blunting effects. There are people who have noticed that when they do cold, cold water immersion, that, that that drops their blood sugar nicely if, if they have spikes. And uh, it's become very popular among so-called body hackers to, to do cold exposure every morning or during the day. Um, there are cryo, cryo places that you can go to, to, get, to get that. But believe it or not, there are a lot of people who, you know, when you really get into reading about how people are sort of doing these things and, and using them in their lives, you know, it, it can, can sort of sound kind of crazy, you know, but, you know, there are people out there that will fill their tubs up with, with ice and they, they'll do a, you know, they'll basically do cold immersion for, because it not only does it activate AMPK, but there's some other beneficial effects in terms of recuperation and uh, for, for athletes and that sort of thing. Uh, Pat's say, asking that she's bought some gynostema tea, how much should she drink? Um, well, I, you know, it's hard to say because you don't really know how many milligrams you're getting with with tea, so maybe it depends how how steep. I you know I drink, I use up this this bag, the one tea bag that I have, will make a couple types of uh, a couple glasses of tea. So I don't know I drink a couple cups per day uh, of it. I like the taste of it, so that's always that's always good. 
Okay, so uh, let's move on. Next is something called sirtuin. And sirtuins are signal, signaling proteins for homeostasis, meaning it's basically affecting the way that your cell balances itself in terms of metabolism. And with aging, sirtuin goes down. It gets down-regulated and the sirtuin levels drop. Now, sirtuins are dependent on something called NAD. Now, NAD has become very on trend now. There are people getting infusions and there are all these high priced supplements uh, that you can take what's called nicotinamide riboside. And it's, I believe it's sort of one of those things like as an example, resveratrol in the, in the very beginning was something that a lot of people took for, you know, and now, you know, people still take it, but it's not as popular. NAD is just one of those like new, new things. And the reason is because sirtuins are dependent on NAD. And you'll see when we look at the diagram, how all these pieces sort of fit together. But the point is, is that I, I wouldn't go crazy with, with this right now. It's every couple years, there is a trend on that, Every one of the, every sort of, you know, trendy guru is, is starting to take. And the fact is, is that it's, you, you, you get, you can get nicotinamide, um, which is a type of vitamin B3. It's related to niacin. You're, it's not like you're completely deficient in that. So in addition to the fact that exercise, uh, fasting, of course, which we've spoken about before, um, and diet, of course, is going to, to be able to boost that. So I wouldn't go crazy. The additional thing about the fact that it's on trend is that I happen to know that some of the companies that make, that did the, some of the researchers that published a, a lot of information on, on supplementing with NAD also have shares in some of the companies that produce the supplements. And so there's a, a definite conflict of interest in the sense that some of these well-known researchers who get onto all of the podcasts who are pushing uh, these various NAD supplements or infusions or whatever have, have a, a self-interest in, in this. So I, I wouldn't go crazy with, um, with, with supplementing with this. Just realize that um, you're, you, with fasting and with a lots of eating, lots of plants, um, you're you're going to get enough n vitamin B3 that you know it's it's going to be you you don't need to necessarily artificially boost with supplementation right now. So uh, there are many different sirtuins, um, and resveratrol again also boosts sirtuins as well. So skin of red grapes, berries, dark chocolate, red wine. Um, you, want, you want to get as many colors into your diet as you possibly can. That's always going to be, you know, eat the rainbow as they say. So, but the um, amazing thing about, about eating various types of berries is that they're relatively low in sugar. And as a result, you're not going to get ton loaded with, with sugar. Um, another way of getting some of these things is to take different types of dried, dried, uh, pigmented things. So you can get dry, you can get pomegranate, dried pomegranate. It's not going to have as much sugar. You can get blueberry powder or all these different things. You can get a multi, uh, uh multi polyphenol, uh, blend of, of sorts that has all these things in there. But if you stick with just berries, you're always going to be benefit. It's always going to be beneficial and it's not going to raise your blood sugar that much. Okay. Let's keep moving on. And the next is preventing cellular senescence. And we spoke actually a little bit about this before, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And when I first, I first learned about cellular senescence, I thought, my God, it's really terrible because what, what happens is that as cells age, they essentially become dysfunctional. And when they become dysfunctional, they actually release chemicals that start to damage the surrounding cells. 
And I thought to myself, that's just horrible <laughs> to think that as your cells age, some of them are going to just start damaging all the other cells around them. Now, the reason that this doesn't happen with the same frequency in people who do calorie restriction is that essentially, if you're not eating that much, you're not going to develop these cells as much. And there've been some very amazing studies, specifically with quercetin and dasatinib, which is essentially a chemotherapy agent. And basically these two, these, this combination has been shown to remove these cells. And as a result, just by removing one or two of these cells, you're going to be able to affect the surrounding cells because there's, they're not going to be damaged. Now, not everyone is obviously going to be doing this. And again, the only people, as far as I know, who are taking dasatinib and um, rapamycin, like we spoke about up here, are really people who are in this sort of anti-aging longevity movement, so to speak. Now, there have been studies to try to come up with plant-based alternatives to having to take dasatinib. And their quercetin in combination with theoflavins, which are found in tea, black tea, and apigenin, which is a very interesting, uh, a very interesting chemical, have been shown to be effective. And I've looked into this and I actually do recommend for, for as an example, my parents that they actually take, it's just a couple pills a week actually, and it can help remove some of these cells. Um, and it's, it is a supplement by the Life Extension Foundation and I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, but if you go to their site and look up cellular senescence, um, I, I just can't remember the name of the supplement, but it, you basically just take two, two pills per week and you can get pretty good effect. There is another plant-based chemical called fisetin, which unfortunately is not bioavailable right now, but apparently I've heard that there are people who are coming up with a way of, of making it bioavailable, meaning be able to absorb in the body. And that that's going to be a major advance in being able to have something that's plant-based that is going to be able to remove these cells that are just sitting there and causing all of this damage. And so, so I would stay tuned for that. Now, apigenin is, is one of these very interesting chemicals that um, this is, that is essentially a known to be sort of an anti-cancer chemical. And um, the best sources are parsley, chamomile, celery, vine spinach, which I believe is, is also called Malabar spinach, uh, artichokes, oregano. And of course, you're going to get the most source of this if it's in dried, dried form because it's going to be condensed. Dried parsley has been reported to have maximal quantity. Um, chamomile, uh, celery seeds, fine spinach, Chinese celery, all of these things. And this article, which, which I had reviewed before in preparing for, for tonight, really spoke about apigenin as a very promising anti-cancer agent. So it was, very, it was a very, very interesting, um, interesting thing. And actually my father who is uh, watching uh, just posted, uh, it's called Senolytic Activator uh, from, from Life Extension Foundation. So thanks, Dad. Um, okay, so oh, one, one of the things I wanted to mention, because th there was a very, this very interesting article by, by Shankar in 2017 about apigenin as its role as an anti-cancer agent. Uh, I believe it was last week. I'm trying to see if I, oh, I think I have the article here. The truth is that whenever you see an article like that, you have to understand one very important thing that you can take almost any you know, pigment or any, um, pl almost any plant-based chemical that's, that has beneficial effects in the vegetable and, and study it. And you're going to almost certainly find incredible benefits for human health. So the question is, is, 
how much weight do you put to these to these things? Because we're dealing with the fact that we only know a certain number of chemicals that you know there are thousands of others that have yet to be studied. So there was this article that that I had uh, read the first sentence to a couple of weeks ago. That I'll just read it again because it's pertinent. It basically says that um, the nutritional components that we know about represent only a small fraction of the more than 26,000 distinct definable biochemicals present in our food, many of which have documented effects on health but remain unquantified. So in other words, there are, you know, we have a couple hundred that we're looking at and there are 26,000 that have benefits that we haven't really gotten to the bottom of. So you're never going to be able to, at least not for a very long time, you're never not going to be able to get the benefits of the same benefits from food that, that you know, you're not gonna be able to take a pill in other words, or create the ultimate supplement plan that is going to ever match the complexity that you're going to get from foods. So you are probably aware that every week I try to focus not on supplements per se, uh, but there, I don't remember which week it was, but I spoke to you about how if you're taking a supplement, you really have to have a very good book, a, a, a lot about that actually. One, I forget which week it was, where we talk about about you know how to choose supplements and why you need to to really understand that. And I think this article really just says it that if you can get it from food. That's great. There are certain things, obviously, we spoke about earlier, like resveratrol, where it's very hard to get the levels needed. But you have to understand that it could be that just by you're always going to have a better benefit by combining lifestyle with with whole plant based foods to be able to get the, the most benefits. But it, nonetheless, when it comes to this um, cellular senescence, some very exciting things happening, and I, I think the science is is far enough along that quercetin, we already know quercetin is incredibly safe as well as theoflavins and apigenin. So just taking two pills uh, of this a week to be able to have some effect on getting rid of these old cells that are damaging surrounding cells is going to be, I think, worth worthwhile. All right, let's move on. And I believe we'll probably end a little bit, little bit sooner tonight than, than last week. Okay, enhancing autophagy. Now autophagy is essentially where your body is based, your cells are renewing themselves. They're recycling the inner machinery. Think about your cell as a, you know, think of it as like a round thing, let's say. And inside there are all these different, it's like a factory. There's, you know, there's the machinery here and there's the, the office and, you know, all these different components to the cell. And as the cell goes through fasting or goes through autophagy, what happens is the cell basically recycles the old comp components of the cell. The cell is actually able remarkably to identify this, say this machinery, uh, it's all gotta go. Basically, essentially in a way digests the, the, the part of the cell that is old, which allows new cell, new components of the cell to form, which basically means that you're taking an old factory with uh, you know, maybe one, one machine in the corner of the, the, main, the main basement is old. And then when autophagy happens, it basically gets renewed and you have a new machine in, in the basement there, which basically means that the, the, the factory itself has essentially become younger in a, in a sense, because you've been able to recycle and regenerate some of the old parts of the cell. And that's essentially what autophagy is. It's a really remarkable thing, I think, if you think about it, that your, your body is capable of one, recognizing what's old in the cell and two, replacing it. To me, that's, that's remarkable. And it points to the fact that our bodies are, are meant to, are, you know, there's protective mechanisms to repair, which is another reason why I really believe that this notion of, of, of aging as a disease, which is 
has been somewhat controversial is something that we should maybe spend a minute on. Uh, a lot of times we think, well, aging, why should we prevent aging? It's a natural course of, of action. And I would say that if we have cellular things that are happening, one that we can get rid of that are, is basically going to continue or get rid of things like these senescent cells that are causing damage. I mean, would you say, would anyone say that it's, natu it's, it's a natural consequence of aging? Therefore, I'm going to do, I'm not going to do anything for these senescent cells. I'll just let them become dysfunctional and damage all the surrounding cells. Or are we going to look at it and say, well, we're aging and we have these cells. It doesn't make sense for us to keep these cells because they're damaging all the other cells. So let's do something about it. I don't see anything wrong with that. I don't see anything unethical about that. I think it's taking scientific knowledge in regards to things that, are, that, that we've been able to identify pathways that are essentially going wrong and just fixing them. If that leads to a longer life, then so be it. What if it just leads to better aging? I think that's fine also, obviously. So as you'll see over the coming years, you'll see articles in the press talking about whether we should look at aging as, as part of a d disease, but I would caution everyone to look at it from, this, from, this, from a scientific perspective and understanding all these different pathways and realizing that there's nothing wrong if you can just help these sorts of things out. You're not, you're not playing God in any way to enhance your autophagy and renew your cells. So keep that in mind because it always sort of comes up in, in the context of you know, understanding aging and what's going on in aging. This is just sort of one of, of, of the, what we're talking about tonight is, is several things that are happening with aging and what we can sort of do about it. And the fact is, is that this whole thing that we're talking about tonight, we wouldn't be discussing if it wasn't for the fact that we've been able to identify that your body has its own protective mechanism that gets activated when you're not overeating and you're, you're actually under eating, which again points to the miraculousness of the body that your, your body is capable of activating all these self-preservation techniques in response to, to, uh, to under eating, which is yet another remarkable thing about the human body. Okay, so getting back to autophagy, fasting, of course. Now, we've spoken about biological fasting, uh, which is basically that five-day reduced calorie diet for, which basically mimics the effect of a water-only fast, but with a reduced calorie diet. And we have a program for that on MiracleNoodle.com. It's called the Pareto Plan, P-A-R-E-T-O. You can look at it on MiracleNoodle.com. And I've spoken about how autophagy is actually starts the second you get into ketosis, but the maximal autophagy really happens day three, four, and five of the fast. You know, you get a little bit of autophagy, but you get an enormous amount of autophagy when you get to these three, four, and five days. Um, and of course you can get that with water only fasting, but because there is this thing called biological fasting now, we don't have to do that. We can just do a five day reduced calorie diet and get the same benefits. Protein cycling, which basically means going on a very low protein diet for a, for a certain period of time. A biological fasting is, is a vegan, five days of vegan, uh, of, of a vegan five days reduced calorie diet. And the reason you should understand is because you're not activating the sensing pathways, which would essentially turn off, uh, somewhat turn off autophagy. The things that we spoke about when we were speaking about, you know, sugar and animal protein, uh, moderate exercise, sauna use, of course, restorative sleep. There's actually autophagy that happens and nightly if you get a good night's sleep. So that's very important. And keep in mind that when you're doing, say, biological fasting, um, what's happening really is that the most important thing is that as you're undergoing autophagy and your, the cellular repair mechanisms are activated and the machinery is basically taken away 
the most important thing is that you eat really well afterwards to rebuild that machinery. So the days after the fast or are almost are actually probably more important than during the fast so that you're basically giving your body the, the energy and the micro and macronutrients it needs to be able to rebuild the components of the cell. But sleep is very, very, very important in, 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 um, in keeping, in activating sort of a daily autophagy. Food and supplements, of course, uh, green tea, coffee, ginseng, chaga, which is a mushroom, reishi mushroom, pomegranate, again, resveratrol, curcumin, and probably thinking about this article, probably a few other thousand things that we haven't yet identified. Uh, so the plant kingdom is really remarkable and has enormous number of things that we could, that we're going to continue to learn from. We're never going to have, create a supplement that can mimic the biochemical diversity of a piece of broccoli. It's going to be a long time coming. So get, so eat your, eat your veggies. All right. Now, before I get into the five lifestyle changes that showed a remarkable increase in life, I just want to show you this diagram. Now, don't freak out, but <laughs> I don't want you to freak out here, but I, will, I just want to, you to see this because I think a lot of you are now going to understand this. You don't have to rec you don't have to look at all of all of this. There's a couple of things about this diagram I just want to briefly go over. Okay, so here's calorie restriction. And what we have over here is is nutrient sensing. Remember nutrient sensing, which is basically animal protein and um, sugar. Let's see, we have uh, things that raise insulin. And as you can see here, so just lump all of these together and that's going to eventually lead to an increase in amateur. Metformin is going to block mTOR. Rapamycin, we spoke about, it's going to block mTOR. Uh, AMPK, believe it or not, blocks mTOR as we've spoken about. So we spoke about AMPK, that was the master switch. We are wired for sirtuins. We spoke about sirtuins, which ultimately is, is going to lead to down here to, to life, lifespan. Resveratrol, it's working on AMPK. It's working on sirtuins. And then we have autophagy, increased autophagy. We spoke about that, which is also going to lead to lifespan. Down here, we have increased fat, increased inflammation, increased protein. We spoke about that with, with, uh, with mTOR, which is going to lead to increased, mTOR is going to lead to increased protein, increased inflammation, increased uh, fat growth. So you see this diagram here, which if I showed you at the very beginning of the talk, you probably would have freaked out, actually makes a whole lot of sense. We've got nutrient sensing, activation, insulin, sugar, protein, leading to increased mTOR, leading to increased protein, increased building of muscles, but increased growth, increased inflammation. We got that a master switch AMPK blocking mTOR, metformin blocking mTOR, rapamycin blocking mTOR, NAD needed. Uh, that's why everyone's so crazy about NAD because you can't get this sirtuins that we spoke about without having that NAD, which ultimately leads down here to uh, an effect on the mitochondria and, and potential increased lifespan. So isn't that something? I hope that you see how not that complicated all that is, and just to show you what it looks like. And, and I'd like to finish tonight, tonight's uh, Wednesday Night Live with just a report that starting at age 50, if all five of the following lifestyle changes are adopted, women have a 14 year extension in life, men have a 12 year extension in life. And I came across this in the same article written by this Arbor in 2018 on this into, into Chopin web, website uh, that you can find. Uh, on YouTube, 
maybe I'll post the link, but if you just search for that, you'll be able to, to find a remarkable uh, review of everything. And that's where that diagram also came from. So can we think to ourselves, um, uh, Pat's asking if I created the diagram, <laughs> definitely not. There's some things on there that I don't even understand um, in terms of like the, the parts of some of those processes. So I did not produce that, she thought I did, but it was from, uh, from this, this article, so. All right, so what do you think these five lifestyle changes that if adopted at the age of 50, starting at age of 50, led to an average increase in lifespan of 14 years and 12 years added to life? It's common sense, but here they are. Smoking cessation, physical activity, 30 minutes a day, um, healthy, uh, healthy diet, healthy BMI and low alcohol consumption. So really when it comes right down to it, knowing all of this science that we've spoken about, which you now understand at least the basics of, nonetheless, when we think about you know, that 80-20 rule where 20% of, of the things that you do make 80% of the effect, this is where, where, this is where you get the most bang for the buck. If you're smoking and you're doing and you're trying to activate all of these other things, it's like, not, it's just, you know, you're, it's not gonna work. It's gonna be minimal. It's gonna be the, it's gonna just not be that effective. Um, physical activity, you absolutely have to have physical activity. As you get older, it's very important for you to do resistance training as well, just for, for a whole host of reasons that we've spoken about in other, other nights, other Wednesday night lives. Uh, healthy diet, which basically lots of, you know, lots of plants, lots of leafy green vegetables, healthy BMI. It is important for you to have a healthy BMI. No question about it. It may not feel like, you know, all of your blood work can be completely fine. And you, you can be a little bit overweight and you have a, high, a little bit higher of a BMI than you probably should. You really, when the BMI gets to be really healthy, you see all kinds of decreases in inflammation. And it's probably a reason why you're, you're getting this low alcohol consumption as well. And I might add that with this study, smoking cessation and physical activity actually co were correlated most with life extension, believe it or not, above, above these. Doesn't mean these aren't important. Um, you had to have all five of these to get this remarkable extension in life. So, so I wanted to end on that just because it's, it's, as much as we'd like to discuss the science, there's a certain amount of common sense that we all sort of understand. And sometimes a lot of us get into too far into the weeds and we don't focus on what really makes a difference, which is basically these, these, these five things. But once we get these five things in and we're maybe constantly continually working on those, then we should start thinking about what are the specific changes in our diet depending on our age, lowering, lowering animal protein, certainly lowering sugar and simple carbohydrates and everything else we discussed. So I think that's gonna be it for tonight. For the next two weeks, next week, we're actually going to be talking about the nine factors that are related to radical remissions of cancer. And there was a, a remarkable book written by uh, Kelly Turner who, who basically studied people who went into radical remissions of cancer. And she came up with nine most common things that, that they had in common. And of course, all families across the country have dealt with cancer. But additional, the additional remarkable thing about this is that even if you're not dealing with cancer, you can learn an enormous amount about what makes a, what, makes, what makes your body change in the most remarkable way. And when I read the book, the most remarkable thing about these nine factors that we'll be discussing next week is that it, it often reorders your priorities when it comes to lifestyle changes. And you might say one thing, you, I guarantee you by the end of next week's lecture, you're actually going to think, well, uh, certain things are more important than you ever really thought they were. Uh, the week after that, in two weeks, we'll be discussing 
how to understand micronutrients. And I'm actually going to show you a micronutrient blood test that I actually did on myself because there's remarkable new lab tests where you can measure micronutrients in the blood. And when you see what's actually, what we're actually capable of measuring these days, by looking at the lab test, you're actually able to understand micronutrients as a whole and how to get them balanced in, in your life. And we'll be talking about fatty acids. We'll be talking about, um, believe it or not, like we spoke about tonight, we'll be talking about amino acids, like the branch chain amino acids. You can measure those in the blood. And of course, vitamin levels and mineral levels as well. And I think just looking at the blood test, you gives you a very unique perspective on understanding how micronutrients work in the body and how they interplay with each other. It's very, it should be very interesting. And uh, I look forward to seeing you then. So those are what's on the lineup for the next two weeks. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, we had a great attendance tonight. Uh, thank you everyone who, who showed up. Uh, and I wish everyone a very good night and everyone should stay safe and healthy. And I will see all of you next week. So thank you again for your attention and have a great night. Good night. Bye.